Okay, so um, I'm happy to uh, be here to present uh, work, and Animox is a kind of special topic also for me. When I was doing my PhD more than 25 years ago, it was considered a totally impossible process, and it was just getting discovered in Delft at that time. And being 25 years in Delft, I've seen this process moving from an impossible process to a worldwide applied process. And that's an interesting development. If you look to the nitrogen cycle, everybody well, who studies environmental engineering gets the nitrogen cycle. And still 20 years ago, this was a relatively easy cycle, discovered about 100 years ago. Nitrifying bacteria, denitrifying bacteria, and nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, if you are a student nowadays, you have a lot more problem than your teachers had because this is the current nitrogen cycle. It became complex. There's turned out to be many more conversions. Um, that's not only the Animox process which is impo Im important there. There's a range of other processes which I won't talk about, but most of them they have come out of the work from uh, Kais Kunin, Mike Jett, and Mark Strauss in Delft and in, in Nijmegen, where I work close together with. The green in here, that's the Animox process, and um, the Animox process is a kind of process which, say, cross-cuts the nitrogen cycle because it converts ammonium together with nitrite into nitrogen gas. So you only have half of the nitrification process needed. You don't need organic carbon. You just use ammonium instead of organic carbon in the denitrification process, or if you want to say it the other way around, use nitrite instead of oxygen in a kind of ammonium oxidation process. Um, before 1990, Animox was, didn't exist. It was a kind of impossible process. Um, but if you look back in the literature, you see that many cases, wastewater engineers report unexpected nitrogen loss in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, if you have biofilm reactors or water process, there was unexpected nitrogen loss, um, which was not really explained, but most likely in many of these cases there was Animox bacteria present. But since it was considered impossible to have ammonium oxidation in the absence of oxygen, uh, nobody really went investigating it. Um, it was suggested that it could be by the, that if there was unexpected nitrogen loss, it could be nitrifying bacteria which do denitrification, and that's correct. Nitrifying bacteria can do so, but even in that time, if you would compare the rates at which nitrifying bacteria do denitrification, you could already realize that these rates are too slow compared to the observations. So <coughs> likely what happened that very often this animox bacteria was already present in treatment plants, but it was a kind of dogma. Ammonium oxidation requires an enzyme, a monooxygenase, and that, mono that needs oxygen. And so if there's no oxygen, the enzyme cannot function. Ammonia cannot be oxidized. And for ammonium oxidation, also in chemistry, you need a strong oxidator. So it should be impossible under anaerobic conditions. Until uh, some 25 years ago, there was a pilot plant in Delft treating industrial wastewater, where the wastewater was first anaerobically treated to produce methane gas. The anaerobic effluent in the second reactor, um, or sorry, the anaerobic effluent in the third reactor here, because they had a met acidification, methanation, separated process. And the third reactor was fed with the sulfide and the ammonia coming from the anaerobic treatment and nitrate coming from the aerobic treatment, so this was a sulfide-based denitrification. That process run, the pilot plant run, and after about one half year, suddenly ammonium disappeared from the effluent and there was full nitrate conversion. The amount of sulfide supplied was not enough for denitrification. And that gave the trigger that something must happen there, and then uh, Arnold Mulder and Professor Kunen start to investigate what was going on. And they quickly came by the paper by Broda, who already predicted that these organisms must be able to exist because converting ammonium with nitrite or nitrate delivers more than enough energy for microbial growth. There would be no limit there. Um, so, oops. so they 
took a, quite a while because you come with a new process where which goes against basic biochemistry which is known at that moment. It took them about six years, seven years to publish the first paper proving that this was truly anaerobic ammonium oxidation and the absence of oxygen ammonia was oxidized. Um, it took also quite a while to figure out which organism it was. Nowadays, genomic technology is very simple. At that time, it was available, but very cumbersome compared to nowadays technology. <coughs> it turned out that a special organism in the order of the Planktomycetalis, it's some order which is hardly studied until that time, was performing this reaction, and it was a peculiar organism from the microbiology. I'm not going in detail in the microbiology in this uh, lecture, but it has internal compartments like a yeast. It generates its energy on the internal membrane and not on the external membrane, so for prokaryotes, that's a very unique characteristic. And it had a very typical membrane lipids, which no other organism have, laterines, kind of a cyclobutane uh, ring type of uh, lipid. There's a wide diversity, many different organisms, fresh water and salt water. They are autotrophic, CO2 as carbon source, and the main characteristic is their extremely slow growth rate, which certainly made it initially um, say 20 years ago in the lab, if you could have one gram of Anamox bacteria, that was already very a lot. <coughs> Whereas nowadays, going to a reactor, they produce tons of Anamox bacteria, but changed. So, but the doubling time is roughly around one week. We know in the meantime, the last year, that's the result of the last six months uh, of research in the lab, that they can actually double maybe every two days. So it's increasing. Um, what was interesting is that the, or the Animox process, this, despite already more than a century investigation in the field on um, nitrogen cycle, has never been discovered in nature. But if you now look, knowing where, how you have to look to it, you, it appears that roughly 50% um, of the nitrogen denitrified in nature is done by Animox and not by the traditional denitrification process. It's just overlooked. If you not know how you have to look, you don't see it. And there are nice examples of people trying to model ecosystems, um, showing that the model doesn't fit, fit the data and report that likely the measurements were not correct. But the model was obviously not correct because they considered heterotrophic denitrification instead of Animox in the process. So it's a very common organism, a very common process, only very recently uh, discovered. The organism has uh, several also process engineering interesting aspects. The most interesting aspect is, of course, that it grows on ammonium and nitrite and forms then dinitrogen gas. It's a very efficient way of converting ammonium into nitrogen gas. The second thing is it's all growing on CO2. And if you grow on CO2, you have to reduce CO2 to biomass, and you need reducing equivalents, so you need to oxidize a compound. And these organisms, they oxidize nitrite to nitrate in order to reduce CO2 to biomass. So these organisms under anaerobic conditions oxidize ammonium to nitrogen gas and oxidize nitrite to nitrate. And the nitrate production in a, in a reactor is a direct measure of the amount of bacteria which has been growing. And that's a, a nice way of, of observing it. There are, Catabolic pathway, very briefly. That's also how these organisms escape the need of molecular oxygen. They do not oxidize ammonia. The first step they do is they convert nitrite into NO with a conventional enzyme, nitrite reductase, the normal enzyme for the denitrification pathway. Then they bind, they make a bonding between NO and ammonium, and that generates hydrazine, and hydrazine you can then oxidize to nitrogen gas. And the electrons released there, they are used from the back, and there's then an electron transport system, and your organism generates energy from that. So in this way, it say, activates the ammonium, though binding with NO, and then it can, you don't need oxygen. Um, recently, it's also shown that this organism um, has a strange behavior because, in principle, it's, it's an autotrophic organism. 
it's an autotrophic organism growing on ammonium and nitrite. But if you, go give, if you grow it on acetate and nitrate, it can grow organotrophic. It uses the acetate not for growth. It uses the acetate to convert nitrate into nitrite and ammonium. It doesn't generate any energy out of that. It just produces in this way its own substrate to convert then ammonium with nitrite into nitrogen gas. So it can use acetate, propionate, formate, and maybe a few other compounds to convert to nitrate to nitrite or ammonium, but it cannot use these compounds for growth. So it's able to oxidize acetate through acetyl-CoA into CO2, but it cannot use that acetyl-CoA as not most other organisms can do to, for growth processes, for whatever reason. Interesting thing is it can, that it, you can set up in the, in the lab a reactor on acetate and nitrate and get only anamox bacteria in it. So they are effectively outcompeting heterotrophic organisms, heterotrophic denitrifiers under these conditions, which is, um, if you think about it, if you study nature, what's happening, you won't observe because you observe normal heterotrophic denitrification instead of, but the organism is in the end performing an anamox reaction. And actually this organism, this Brocadia fulgida and others, in many places where now anamox bacteria are applied, that's behind anaerobic digesters, there is acetate always a bit left over of some fatty acids in the anaerobic effluent. And if you look in these reactors, it's these type of organic ammoni uh, anamox bacteria which are actually active there. They also oxidize the remaining organic BOD in the anaerobic effluent from the reactor. Um, so, <coughs> this is again that, that whole scheme, but uh, <coughs> the reason to apply Anamox, now we go more to the engineering part, is it's nice shortcut in the denitrification. <coughs> now normally you would have to oxidize all ammonia into nitrate, you could try nitrite, and then you need organic carbon to remove the nitrate or nitrite to nitrogen gas. And in this case, you um, only have to oxidize half of the ammonia to nitrite, and the other half of the ammonia is then converted in nitrogen gas. It's roughly half-half. It's a bit more complicated, but <coughs> that's the essence. This means that if you have a waste stream which contains organic carbon, you can first convert all the organic carbon into methane, produce biogas. <coughs> so you don't need energy for that. You produce energy. Then you're left over with the nitrogen, and normally you would say that's a problem because after the balance between nutrient removal and organic and being energy neutral or energy producing, but then you can use the anamox process to convert the ammonium which is left over in a, in a process which would require less energy than when you do nitrification into nitrogen gas. And that is then also the main application, apply anamox after anaerobic treatment or after a pretreatment which removes all the BOD and the COD from, for instance, municipal wastewater. You concentrate it, you send it to the digester, and then in the second stage, try to remove the nitrogen with, with this organism. And the only problem is the relatively slow growth rate. That's uh, until recently it was thought it was about one week, ten days as division time. It might be just two days as division time, but it's still slow. So you would need a very good biomass retention system and for, for this Anamox processes. And the clear advantages are if you compare conventional process with a nitrotation Anamox process, you save more than half in the energy consumption. Instead of 2.8 kilowatt hour per kilogram nitrogen, you only need one kilowatt hour per kilogram of nitrogen. And if you do the denitrification with methanol, you, of course, save the methanol and you don't have sludge production. And the problem of applying methanol is still part of the methanol goes into sludge and that's a cost factor, again, at the treatment plant. So the overall cost are roughly 20 to 30% of the normal nitrification, denitrification process. And if you do the carbon credit counting, um, you have, well, around four to five tons of CO2 per ton of nitrogen produced in the conventional process. That's including the methanol, including the energy. And for the anamox, you have roughly only 0.7 tons of CO2 produced. So it's 
also in that point, a, a nice process. Now, introducing a technology in practice takes time. And uh, this is just a timeline uh, to show you a bit how it worked over, over time. So around 88, when I got my PhD, so I didn't work in my PhD study on this process, but around that time, uh, there was this observation that something weird was happening in the plant in, in, in Delft, and we in the lab quite quickly agreed that this must be this unknown process of anaerobic ammonium oxidation. It took, the point was that that observation was made in a pilot plant at a company. And then it's very difficult because the company asked for a patent. You try to go to the National Science Foundation for financing to investigate what's going on. They say, well, that company has a patent, so why is it the company paying your research? So it took about four years to secure research money. Uh, besides, of course, if you go to a life sciences board and you tell that you have anaerobic ammonium oxidation, you want to investigate it. Also, the people in this science foundation say it's impossible. We're not going to spend money on you. But it uh, took four years. And after four years, that pilot plant was already gone because the industry is not interested to maintain it. Um, so we had to start completely new with a fresh PhD student who took three years work on getting the message from their PhD supervisor. Well, you've seen this three or four years ago, this strange behavior of a plant, and we think it's a good PhD topic for you. And then it took her at least three years to get, again, a system which showed the same activity. So she was quite persistent in getting it, and in the end that led also to very nice publications. But um, you have to believe that uh, your supervisor is not telling you uh, fairy tales <laughs> as a student. So that led in 1995 uh, to the first uh, publication that this was really where we could show that it was occurring. And a year later, we could really show how to cultivate this organism in a reliable way. So that we start the sludge and within three or four months have an anamox culture. Um, 1998 was the first description of which organism is doing, how it's doing. So that's already 10 years after the first observation, we knew, okay, this is the organism and this is the way it's happening. And <coughs> with that, we partly realized that in the original patent something was wrong because the original patent was based on nitrate. And we realized the organism is using nitrite, so we filed a new patent and in that way, made the original patent from the company not valid anymore, or at least not useful anymore. And we could start to come to work with another company, Parks, which is an environmental engineering company in the Netherlands to develop the technology into practice. It was decided to go directly from the lab to a full-scale reactor. That's a risky business, because normally you would have a pilot plant and a testing procedure and other things. But we could convince the water board that um, they could start with a pilot plant that would take a certain budget. They could start with a full-scale plant that would take a certain budget, but that was only maybe 50% more because the reactor costs are not the main issue. It's the analyzers, the people, and things around. So the water board decided to go immediately for full-scale, which meant that it took three years to get that full-scale reactor running because effectively we had to learn everything on full scale that you normally have to learn on pilot scale. And then in uh, 2005 was its second full scale reactor and then 2006 on really the market started to grow and the number of installations has increased. Now why was this water board interested in applying Anamox? It was rather simple. This is Rotterdam, this is the old harbor of Rotterdam and in one of these harbors, this one, they emptied the water, they put in a treatment plant, covered it, and built houses on top. And that treatment plant was removing the organic carbon, was nitrifying, but not fully denitrifying, and didn't fulfill the new effluent legislations anymore. And <clears throat> there's no way to expand this treatment plant. It's underground, every square meter is used, there's no way to build here up on top of it. That's a park where the, the people in the around are, are using it. They wouldn't like that activities. And so the idea was that here is the sludge handling facility of that plant. So there's a pipeline going to here with the waste sludge and there's effluent going back. And this back return flow is, is roughly in this case 
because it's an extremely high loaded first stage and a very low loaded second stage plant, it's a two stage plant. It's about 15 to 20 percent of the ammonia load to this plant is coming from the sludge handling. So if you can prevent that ammonia is going back from here to here, you save about four or five milligrams of nitrogen in the effluent. And that would almost get back to the effluent requirements for the water board. So for them it was essential to have a technology here which could um, remove the nitrogen. So we started there because they had an urgency this is a nitratation denitratation process, that's the Sharon process. But that process requires methanol, so once the Animox process started a bit to develop, it was of course logical to convert that nitratation denitratation process into a nitratation Animox process, simply because the payback time of such a reactor compared to the methanol cost at that time in the Netherlands was roughly three years. So that was a, a reason for the water board to say, okay, we, we just do it because we believe in it and uh, we don't need all the testing, etc. Uh, we go ahead. So it was originally a kind of two-step process. First, a nitratation reactor because you have to supply nitrite. And that is at warm flows and at high temperatures relatively easy to stop nitrification at roughly uh, at, at nitrite. And also, if you need the influence for the Animox process, um, if you take anaerobic effluent from a digester and the only thing you do is aerate, you will automatically get a mixture of roughly 50% nitrite, 50% ammonia. No process control needed because in the effluent of the digester, ammonia is present as ammonium carbonate. If you oxidize ammonia, you produce two units of acid. So if you have oxidized half of the ammonia, you produce a double amount of acid and that's equivalent to the amount of bicarbonate. So you depleted the whole buffer and then the pH drops and the process stops by itself. So it's a chemical controlled process. And um, then behind this was put this uh, reactor. It's derived from, for those of you who are familiar with anaerobic wastewater treatment, internal circulation reactor, which is used uh, nowadays for, uh, for anaerobic biogas production. It's relying on bacteria growing as granules. Animox very easily make granular sludge. So you can achieve a high biomass concentration. Um, the reason to choose that reactor, because that reactor was known, at least for the application in, in biogas production, not for denitrification. There was no sludge, so that took anyway time. Um, but it was decided to directly build this full scale, starting from 15 liters to 70 cubic meters. But we had no inoculum because there was no other reactor running except this 15 liter reactor. But at that time in the lab, we were always very precious on our Animox biomass because there was so little available to do tests and other things in the lab. Uh, toxicity tests we didn't do because it would just kill the biomass we have at that time. So um, this is the aerial view, the digesters. The treatment plant is 450 population equivalent, so roughly the treatment, treating the wastewater for 450,000 inhabitants. Um, the digesters in an uh, old thickener, which was not used anymore because it was replaced by centrifuges, we could implement the nitratation process already in 1996. So it was operating since 1996 and in 2002 we added this Animox reactor, uh, which has a much smaller footprint simply because the biomass concentration in that reactor is, is much higher. Now, that took three years to start up, and that's mainly troubleshooting, getting things done. If there's no sludge with an organism which divides roughly every two weeks, once you lose it, it takes a long time to build it up again. Um, so it took roughly three years to get, get it running. And here it's nice because in an old-fashioned, in an old system, if you run for two years a reactor and it shows that there's no conversion. The water board gets very, well, start to ask, are we do, dealing with a phantom or are we dealing with something which is really going on? The nice thing is what that at that time it was just the first years that you could QPCR for analyzing DNA. And during this period when we could not, for two years long, not measure any conversion inside the treatment plant, on, at least not on ammonium or nitrate measurements, we could measure the DNA of the Animox bacteria and could see that each time in between, Animox was growing exponential. So we 
we really had a big advantage of having the molecular tools that we could show that indeed there is something going on. Bacteria are growing, um, but each time if there's some incident, we lose a lot of these organisms. And uh, without having the molecular tools, I'm not sure whether we could have convinced the water board to go on for two years without any, anything happening in the reactor. But when, it, when it finally came up, it failed again two times, but then uh, it was learned what was, how to deal with it. And um, since then, it's operating stable since 2006. It's now already for eight years or seven years, continuously operating. Very stable, no incidents, well, hardly any incidents at the loading rate of 7 kilogram of nitrogen per cubic meter per day. So it's a very high loading rate, but that's because it's only the anaerobic conversion and a capacity of roughly 800 kilogram per day, conversion capacity. So this is uh, the example of 2007, one year after that it started running well. And you see these are the conversion capacity. Uh, the blue line is the ammonium removal efficiency during that year, between 95 and 99%, and the total end removal capacity uh, initially around 80 and in the end of the year around 90%. What was interesting, because um, once they knew that they could now remove a lot of the ammonia in the side stream, the treatment plant operators started to optimize the amount of ammonia directed towards the side stream. If you know that you can handle it there, you can optimize your plant, start looking at thickeners and other operations to put as much as possible ammonia in that direction. And you see that in one year, they managed to go from roughly 500, which was the standard practice, by optimizing that to somewhere around 700, 800 kilograms. So it was a big extra improvement on it. <coughs> on the top of that, it also improved some other management aspect on, on the plant. But Having the side stream treatment give the incentive to the operators to try to maximize the load and by just good management of the total plant. Um, so 2007 it runs stable, 2008 it runs stable, 2009 it runs stable. And you see here the, again, 2009 line, the nitrate is, all the, uh, nitrate is produced because you produce these Animox bacteria. Ammonia, this period we wanted to show that it's really possible to reach very low effluent qualities, so very high effluent qualities, I should say. And the incoming ammonia is around 1,400 milligram ammonia per liter. And here the effluent in these months, you could keep this at 10 milligram ammonia. So that's a very high removal efficiency. Also nitrite is all the time low. But in order to do here, these periods, there's no control. Just uh, one day a week, a bit maintenance. That's the only thing they did. Here, it needed attention to really optimize it. So <clears throat> they didn't want to do that because this was good enough. The effluent anyway goes back in the main treatment plant and not to the surface waters. But by 2010, the operators probably got a bit relaxed. And at a certain moment, there was uh, an acid-based uh, tank emptied into the side stream line, which resulted in a very high pH. Was for one or two days, the pH was uh, roughly nine and a half in the, in the plant. This immediately led to, you see here, it's almost influent concentrations. But within, this is March, within one week, this pH shock is, has been overcome. In summer, a similar, a different incident happened. We had that summer, a very warm summer, and you, this reactor is open to the air. It heated up well above 30 degrees, and uh, the Animox bacteria got a bit cooked in July when the operators were on holidays. So it took time for them to come back to pay attention to it. But uh, again, despite that all the sludge was lost, was completely lost, uh, within a few weeks, everything was started up and fully operative again, showing that it is possible to, once you know how to run it, within one, a few weeks you can start up these reactors and there are incidents if you have op uh, yeah, the operators get too relaxed, but it's running stable. So after that, um, the technology, <coughs> at least Parks, is mainly operating these plants in the uh, in industrial context. So the second treatment was of, on a tannery wastewater, 300 kil uh, kilograms of nitrogen per day. And that consists of, again, the anaerobic, um, anaerobic uh, methane reactor, an aerobic 
nitrotation reactor, and then the anamox reactor behind it. So it's a very compact unit. I uh, forgot exactly the BOD and the C reloadings, but uh, the, the ammonia conversion in this total set is around 300 kilograms per day. <coughs> so a very small footprint and a very efficient way because for industrial wastewater, this combination, having a biogas system followed by nitrotation or one-step anamox process, um, yeah, you produce a lot of energy because the BOD concentrations in the industry are way higher than for municipal wastewater, and you get very nice low ammonium effluent, which you can have on the concentration level that you, as an industry you can directly discharge to the surface water. And for the industry, this means you're not relying anymore on the sewer and on the, uh, the municipal treatment plant. This, of course, gives some friction between water boards and industry, but for the industry, they can go become independent and manage their own system. Now, <coughs> originally we developed it as a two-step process, simply because uh, that nitrotation process was already there and it looked very simple to first start with a full anamox process so that we can optimize the reactor for anamox conversion alone. But having two reactors, that's not very efficient. So quite rapidly we started to develop in the lab a system where we could integrate nitrotation and anamox. And um, as you might know from the Netherlands, uh, we like granulars. We like operating granular sludge systems for all kinds of reasons. Um, so also here we wanted to go into granular sludge. And by the way, um, the nice thing of Anamox is that where most of the wastewater sludges are brown or black, these organisms have a nice reddish color. So it's a bit of change in, in, the, in the environmental field to have a colorful process. Um, so integrating nitrotation and anamox, uh, that can be done by, it's rather simple, you have an anamox granule, there's anamox bacteria, and you grow on top of it a layer of ammonium oxidizing bacteria, and you supply oxygen just enough to have um, half of the ammonia converted to, um, to nitrite. So you adjust your oxygen level in such a way that the flux of oxygen, the diffusion of oxygen, is roughly half of the diffusion rate of ammonia flux. Then in the outside, you get oxygen oxidized to nitrite, and in the inside, nitrite is taken away by the anamox bacteria. Now, the nitrite oxidizing bacteria, certainly at higher temperatures, they are competed here out on two different ways, because in the aerobic layer, they get competition of the ammonium oxidizers. They both need oxygen, but the ammonium oxidizers are a bit more efficient in taking oxygen. Moreover, in a biofilm system, the ammonium oxidizers tend to grow a bit more outside of the nitrite oxidizing bacteria. So on the aerobic layer, they are competed out by the um, ammonium oxidizing bacteria, and then the ammonium oxidizing bacteria on top of the anamox bacteria, so the anamox bacteria are a sink for the nitrite, so all the nitrite diffuses inside. The affinity for nitrite from anamox is much higher than for NOB bacteria, so there's a sink into the direction. So besides that they are competing for oxygen, they also have to compete for nitrite, and these two factors together mean that you can very stable in a biofilm system get rid of nitrite oxidizing bacteria or prevent them growing into the system. And then you get this overall <coughs> conversion um, and nice community together. And you don't need to do much for that. The only thing what you have to do is to supply, to adjust your aeration rate to the ammonium loading rate and making sure that you do not supply more than oxygen than roughly half of what you need for full ammonium oxidation. And there are that, that competition between these organisms really exist is what you can see if you have thin biofilms or small granules, then inside there's not enough anamox. These anamox bacteria would um, not be a, as effective sink than when there's sufficient anamox inside. So what you see in small granules or in thin biofilms, you will see that you have on the outside, certainly you have the AOB, in between, you get an NOB community and an inside your dominant anamox. In, in larger granules, thick biofilms, you will never see NOB bacteria in between. And that's just 
this competition between Animox and NOB bacteria where Animox effectively, despite that they are not growing there where the nitrite is produced, are keeping the nitrite concentration low enough and together with the AOB, they keep the NOB out of the system. <coughs> and that means also that if you run a granular sludge reactor, you can select because you take your discharge only the smaller granules. Now, if you have an upflow blanket, the smaller granules are always on top of the blanket. So your excess sludge you take from the bottom, from the top, and you prevent that you get small granules in accumulating in the reactor, and you select nicely for the community only consisting of ammonium oxidizing bacteria, half aerobic ammonium oxidizing bacteria, and half anaerobic ammonium oxidizing bacteria. Now, if this process, what uh, has, has developed is, um, in general, if you have sludge water, there's suspended COD. So, if you think about Animox process, where you have to really think about is that if you have a digester, the people at the treatment plant, they might have a belt press or a centrifuge, and officially there's no suspended solids coming out of the belt press or the centrifuge, but in practice, there's always coming suspended solids out of that. So if you don't take that into account, you have a problem. Now, Animox sludge is producing, is growing slowly and not a lot. So if you would have half a gram per liter of SS in your digesting water, it's accumulating in the reactor. So you need granular sludge or biofilms to be efficiently separating between flocculant sludge and keep your granules in. And we do that uh, by applying tilted plate settlers uh, they separate nicely the granules out of the, and, and let the flocks go through. Um, there's another uh, application where, uh, where a um, cyclone is used to separate the flocks from the granules. You need oxygen control. Um, nicest way is to operate around one milligram per liter because you have a good driving force and that's possible. Um, and what is important, well, there's some people who prefer to have on-off aeration, but you can easily operate at continuous aeration. If you have continuous aeration, you um, balance, of course, the oxygen load continuously with the ammonium load. It's a little bit more complex maybe in the process control than on-off aeration, but you save in aeration equipment because half the time is not used in, in an on-off aeration, and uh, also that's continuous on off settling gives a lot of maintenance instead of a continuous operation. Look to volumes. If you have granular sludge reactors in the lab, you can go well above 10 kilogram nitrogen per cubic meter per day. In practice, it's the, the one in Rotterdam is still the highest loaded with about 7 kilogram nitrogen per cubic meter per day. But that's if you have pure Animox bacteria. If you have the mixture of nitrogen Animox in one reactor, the conversion gets limited by the aeration capacity of the plant and not by the microbiology. You have more than enough sludge, it's just bringing in enough oxygen, it's limiting, and then you can go up to three to four kilogram nitrogen per cubic meter a day as, as loading rate. <coughs> Still, if you compare that with a normal municipal plant, that's a very high loading rate. And startup, it is advantage to ship granular sludge around carriers, so if you have granular sludge or carriers, you can easily ship them around of the world, except for some countries where import of biological material is a problem, but the rest of the world, you can bring the sludge, start up the reactor, and the start up times nowadays, they are in the order of one month. Um, so <coughs> we look to these one reactor granular sludge systems. Um, they're essentially based on the UASB technology, very well known technology, uh, upflow blanket, where in the USB reactor is not aerated, this has to be aerated. Because you aerate, you have mixing. A USB reactor has an extensive introduction of the wastewater. That's not needed in these reactors because due to the mixing, the wastewater will be mixed up. Uh, so there's no need for uh, influent distribution and keep the granules in with a tilted plate settler. <coughs> now, nitrite is sometimes reported as being toxic for if you operate these reactors at zero nitrite in the effluent, you get a sludge which is very sensitive to nitrite. As soon as nitrite goes up to 5 to 10 milligram per liter, you get inhibition. If you run these reactors at 3 or 4 milligram nitrite, 
you, you get a community which is adopted to nitrite, and it can easily go up to 100 milligram per liter. But it's quite essential that they are resistant because if your influent concentration is around one gram, thousand milligrams of ammonia, and if 10 milligrams would be toxic, which means if 1% would accumulate in the reactor, you would already have a problem. The process control is too tight. So that's why, in general, you operate these reactors at least at the true 3, 4 milligram of nitrite in the effluent, which for sludge, <coughs> um, for sludge water, if you would apply it in mainstream, it's a different issue. Process control is relatively easy because you measure what we do. We measure ammonium. If the ammonium concentration goes up, we know the aeration has to go up. If the ammonium concentration goes down, the aeration is tuned. So it's an aeration control based on the ammonium measurement, and that is good enough. That works quite well, and the only thing what you have to watch out for is that if the ammonia goes up because some misbehavior that you not keep on aerating. So there's an extra control loop for that. So the reactors are rather simple. Aeration in the bottom, granular sludge develop, um, filter plate settlers in the top, temperature is measured, pH is measured, oxygen is measured and controlled, nitrite is measured, and ammonium is used as the input for the controller. That's the essence and the general design Loading rates for this kind of granular sludge process is in the order of two kilogram nitrogen cubic meter per day. You could design them at three to four, but again, if you operate at maxima, that's, that gives in, in, inflexibility at the treatment plant. So this is how these reactors look. On the bottom, membrane diffusers. Um, these um, tilted plate clarifiers, they are just installed inside the tank on poles. So this makes it possible to reconfigure existing tank volume because you just need an empty tank, you put in the diffusers, you put in the clarifiers, or the filter plate clarifiers, and you can operate the system, which is very handy for uh, um, existing, upgrading existing facilities. Now here, one example which is also interesting as, as a kind of symbiosis between industry and, and the water board. In this case, there's a water board one third of the wastewater comes from a potato factory. What they did have a separate pipeline from the, from the potato factory. <coughs> so two thirds of the water is municipal wastewater. One third goes, oops, goes first in this UHB reactor. That's the potato wastewater. That is converted into biogas. The biogas is cleaned up for the, to get the sulfur out of it. And then it's used in the combined heat and power together with the biogas coming from the digester. The digester sludge from the municipal treatment plant is then dewatered. Combined with the effluent from the UHB reactor, there's a struvite uh, recovery, phosphate recovery unit. And finally, there's, oops, there's, a, there's an anamox reactor. Um, in this case, the total uh, um, conversions, well, for phosphate, it's around... Uh, 250 kilogram phosphate per day, which is uh, recovered, and the anamox treats about 1,200 kilogram of nitrogen per day. And in this total system, the COD removal, um, that's for those of you who are interested in stru struvite technology, this uh, struvite reactor also removes the remaining PFAs from the UHB, so the remaining BOD, and separates the remaining BOD sludge from the uh, struvite granules with these integrated uh, clarifiers. So the COD is removed, the biodegradable BOD is completely removed, phosphate is 80% is recovered, ammonium removal is nitrogen uh, is uh, 90%. This is how it looks from the outside, not very spectacular, it's just a box uh, system. Um, the plant, so for this size of plant, um, here is the the struvite reactor, this is the anamox reactor, and this is just maintenance buildings with the magnesium storage pumps, struvite storage blowers. So it's a rather compact unit on it. Um, with applying this, you have about 1.5 gig gigawatt hour per year extra energy production at this site, and they have about 600 tons per year less sludge produced compared to the previous operation. Now this 
plant was the second, first one stage plant, so that took again a few months for uh, starting it up. But since um, 2006, it's effectively running stable with a low ammonium effluent and roughly, in this case, 800 milligram ammonium influent. And this is just a long-term observation for about uh, three years, and you see that the effluent ammonia is more, besides a few hiccups in these three years here and here, is rather stable with more or less also stable influence because after the general digestion and the potato factory is also operating all year. It's a factory for producing chips and it's not so it's processing the harvest the whole year. Um, the volum volumetric loading rates they are here around 1.5 to 2 kilogram nitrogen per cubic meter in a day and the loading rates per sludge is 0.2 kilogram nitrogen per gram of TSS for those of you who are familiar with these numbers and now operating already seven years stable. So the biggest application at the moment is in, uh, mainly in China. That's a nice, well, it's an advantage if you have nothing. You much e easier introduce new technology than when a lot of technology is already there. So in China are now the biggest anamox reactors. This is on a glutamate factory. They are first again this IC reactor at 20 meters high and a few meters diameter producing biogas. And um, so about 20,000 cubic meters of biogas per day produced. And this box here on the side, that's the Anamox reactor removing about 11 tons of nitrogen per day. And, and also here, you get nice granular sludge. The tank, the loading rate is here, one kilogram per cube. Startup time was one half month. This was the first reactor started up. But even at this 11 ton of nitrogen per day, it took only one half month to get it in full running. The system is again, yeah, it's a kind of black box. Uh, here you see the aeration units, and on top you see these are effectively the filter plate clarifiers, the, the lids of it. <coughs> also, I hear the startup of this first reactor, and uh, the, since then it's running stable. There's an influence, in this case of around 300 milligrams, so more diluted water an effluent of roughly 10 milligrams, 5 to 10 milligrams of, of ammonia. And that, no, I can't show this graphs, but they are rather boring because it's rather stable. And the overall experience is that once it started up and relatively under control, there's not much, main, not much maintenance needed. So it's a simple process. This is the largest application at the moment in, uh, of Anamox in a municipal setting. This is in Minworth in the UK. That's four tons of nitrogen per day. Their um, existing tank volume has, has been used where then these clarifier have been put in and reorganized. And that's since 2012 now running and in full operation. And this is just, uh, if you look from the top, the municipal plants, they are sometimes covered, sometimes not. In this case, they're not covered, but you see here these tilted plate clarifier uh, settlers, and here you just see the aeration, and if you look well, you see this reddish color from, from the anamox in the sludge. And so in the Minworth, it took about 30 days, one month to start up. There the influence is again around 700 milligram per liter, and you can see that, well, from day 15 till day 45 and 20 days, they more or less grew in. They operate now at around 100 milligram per liter effluent. I think they could do it better, but that's what they do. And the startup time, one month, and a bit lower temperature than all the other Anamox systems. And, well, it's again, a similar system, but repeating um, the, uh, the technology. So for industrial wastewater, this is a very big advantage because there it's, it's all clear, that's all working. Um, Startups go well, conversions are well, and you will see that here in the list of, of references. Um, yeah, the, a lot is in the industrial context. There's the biggest advantage. In the municipal context, it can be applied in, in side stream, but the advantages are not that big, so that's why there's less attention. Now, if you look worldwide on Anamox applications, this is from a paper from uh, Neatling in 2012. Um, the granular sludge, that's the green one, and 
there is a demon, the demonification process is based on, on granular sludge, anamox, and flocculant sludge nitrifiers. It's a bit different application. There is much more of these deammonification plants, or at least that's roughly two-thirds of the mark. One-third is anamox, but if you look in conversion capacity, 80% is granular sludge, and 20% is this demon type of process. And that has to do with the fact that parks is very much oriented to industry, which have huge amounts, and the demon process is much more oriented to municipal treatment plants. Now, there are, in the meantime, several types of Animox process you can buy on the market, so it's a relatively well-developed uh, system. There's the process which, say, was developed in, in the Netherlands based on granular sludge, pure granular sludge. There's the process developed in Austria based on Animox and gran originally completely flockland sludge, but nowadays Animox and granules nitrifiers in, in flocks. Um, in Germany, the AOA group has Im implemented several SBR type of application completely rely on, on flocculent sludge and that's possible in, in Switzerland because there the operators maintain really low suspended solids after their solid separation. In many other countries that would not work for because the solids from the separation would go through. And then Veolia is, uh, and uh, Purac, they are, have the MB, MBBR applications. And this is roughly what the design loads are for the different processes and the number of plants. And you see that the Animox from Parks and the Demon from Cyclar are the two dominant technologies and the rest is lagging behind. Probably from Veolia there will be more because Veolia is big enough to get that process around. But there is a choice of technology, so it's not the one supplier market and there's many applications. Um, one remark around Animox and energy self-sufficiency. Animox application in the side stream will not lead to energy self-sufficiency. Um, the uh, side stream treats 10 to 20% of the ammonium load. Nitrification Animox saves about 60% in aeration energy. Nitrification is 50% of the aeration energy. This means you save 2 to 4% in the energy consumption of the treatment plant if you apply Animox in the side stream. It is a nice way to optimize the plant if your effluent quality is not fulfilling and you have to decrease it with a few milligrams per liter. But you're not getting cell sufficient by just applying Animox in the side stream. It's too small effect. <coughs> um, the real re reason is that if you apply first a good BOD, COD separation, concentration, digestion, that delivers you the energy. That prevents a lot of aeration energy for aerobic processes and that generates any energy to run the treatment plant. And actually, without applying Animox in the mainstream, and of course, if you do that, a lot of ammonia is incorporated in the sludge and ends up in the side stream, and then it helps to have an Animox in the side stream. Uh, in the, at least in Europe, I don't know exactly for the American condition, but in, in Europe, with the wastewater composition in Europe, the COD N ratios, it means that if you want, you can design a treatment plant completely energy production on conventional technology. Two-stage system with Animox in the side stream leads to an energy producing plant, but the energy production comes from this first high loaded stage and Animox is a bit of a help to, to achieve it. Um, it would of course be then very beneficial because the problem is if you apply that, you have a high loaded A stage, your B stage, your second stage gets the ammonia and it would be very beneficial to apply Animox there. Now that is still a problem, because here you operate at lower temperatures in the winter up to 8 degrees Celsius and lower concentrations and with a high effluent quality demand. It's not just good to remove 99%, but you have to achieve 3, 4, 5 milligram total nitrogen. And that's at other constraints, also on reliability and other issues. So at currently, uh, this would lead to a net if you would be able to apply Animox here, that would lead to really net energy producing systems. But that's the current state of development where we are looking at how to achieve that. We are again at this wastewater treatment plant in Rotterdam, which is a two-stage system. I loaded first stage to give an ID. Solid retention time is there only eight hours and it removes 90% of the BOD in this eight hours. Solid retention time and 20 minutes hydraulic retention time. So very efficient 
BOD CO2 removal, high sludge production, digester, but then you have here the problem. So we're looking how to replace this tank with a Animox system, partial nitrification Animox. And that's the pilot plant we're currently running. Um, well, here you see the details of the process uh, parameters of this pilot plant, but influent COD is 60 milligram per liter, but that's largely inert COD. BOD is only 20 milligram per liter. Um, the ammonia is 30 to 40 milligram per liter. This reactor is four cubic meters. That's the scale at which we're testing it yet. It goes between 10 and 20 degrees between summer and winter. And we maintain roughly four grams of, of uh, granular sludge. So this is the granular animox sludge, which is growing in this reactor on the municipal wastewater. So it's nicely forming granules. There's a bit of, of uh, heterotrophs growing on top of it to remove, which is then removing the BOD that is not limiting the process in, in either way. And we operate roughly at, at one to two milligram per liter. Now that goes on and off with technical problems, but this is somehow the first run. And you see that we can get a reasonable um, um, conversion. This is the total end removal rate, the blue line. There are some periods with technical problems in between. The ammonium conversion rate and um, we can see Animox is growing. We get, once it's going well, we get ammonium or total end removal rates of 100 milligram per liter per day, which is for a municipal treatment plant very acceptable or even a very good conversion capacity. But we will have to solve this kind of, of hiccups and other things uh, to, to reach there. But with this first trial, we already, already reach more or less. Um, this is the influent ammonia. This is the effluent of the, the nitrotation um, uh, Animox reactor. This is the effluent of the current st nit uh, nitrification stage. And we see that with the effluent ammonia, we're still a bit above the current reactor. The volumetric capacity is, by the way, higher. With nitrite, of course, we are a bit higher. With nitrate, we are lower. And, of course, with the total end, we are also already lower than the existing facility. So it's not too far away to get at uh, probably in, in, a, in a proper way. And these are just the volumetric and biomass specific co conversion rates. And you see that the volumetric rates are already well built above the standard activated sludge systems. And because we can maintain them as granular sludge, we think that these volumetric rates can theoretically at least be a factor four or five higher. We're not at the, at the limit yet. This will not be practical for all kinds of other reasons, but that's, that's what works. We also nicely observe Animox growing. Um, where the heterotroph in the excess sludge, we mainly have heterotrophs because they grow on the outside of the granule. So the heterotrophs are sloughed off, and that is what we take out as excess sludge. So we have a set, uh, um, um, uh, how to say in English, the, a separate, uh, the, we enrich for the animal bacteria relative to the heterotrophs in the system in a natural way. So overall, it, Animox in side stream, high temperature, industrial wastewater, it's a full grown technology which certainly for the industry makes it possible to reach very good effluent qualities with producing a lot of energy and consuming minimum amount of energy. It's a good way for side stream treatment at municipal treatment plants to optimize the plant and we are not far away from applying it in the mainstream treatment plant which would mean that also in the municipal treatment plants the energy consumption would be greatly reduced and maybe even going to sufficient energy production without buying BOD from outside the plant, as sometimes is happening. And uh, over time, this has been a collaboration with uh, company Parks, where we collaborate with the Water Board, Hollands Delta, uh, which is very important, and our colleagues at the University of Nijmegen would do all the microbiology of Animox. <coughs> and with that, I want to uh, close with a view on, on Delft and its water systems, and thank you for your attention.